Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our lecture series here at Middle East Studies. Uh, it's always a very happy occasion um, for Middle East Studies to showcase and celebrate the publication of a book by uh, one of our colleagues here, Brown, who works on this region. Uh, my name is Bishar Dumani. I'm director of Middle East Studies, and it's my real pleasure to introduce to you today very quickly because we have a tradition here of not doing introductions. <laughs> Uh, my colleague <coughs> from the Department of History, Jennifer Johnson. Um, we're actually proud to have had two or three such uh, book signing events every year since I've been here. Show, shows the productivity of, uh, of the faculty who work on this region, <coughs> as well as the growing uh, number of faculty at Brown who work on this region. Uh, for the past three generations, uh, Algeria has been the icon of perhaps the deepest and most violent colonial conflict in the Middle East and North Africa, from the French conquest in the 1830s till uh, independence in 1962. Uh, <clears throat> and it's always been a kind of a monotone discussion of uh, this period for a lot of the scholarship. Uh, Jennifer Johnson's book, uh, reinterprets uh, the battle for Algeria, the decolonization of Algeria in a fresh new way that she'll tell you all about in just a second. We're very excited about this book, which came out, is available outside. Uh, <clears throat> Jennifer Johnson is an assistant professor in history at Brown University and a Brown alum, I should add. She received her PhD from Princeton University and previously taught at Lehman College and the City College of New York. <clears throat> Her main research interests are 20th century Africa, specifically the Maghreb, North Africa, nationalism, decolonization, and public health. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we're proud here in <clears throat> Middle East studies that uh, we're border crossers, excuse me. <clears throat> Many of our faculty bring different regions together, and so does Jennifer. Uh, with the support of uh, <clears throat> Woodrow Wilson, I'm sorry, fellowship, <clears throat> she is currently working on a second book project which examines medicine and public health in post-colonial North Africa between 1956 and 1975. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you, Bashar, for hosting me and putting on this wonderful event. So today I'm going to be discussing research from my new book, The Battle for Algeria, which focuses on the Algerian War between 1954 and 1962, and the innovative strategies that the Algerian nationalists used during the decolonization process, which ultimately enabled them to gain their independence. So frequently, when one thinks about Algeria, two references come to mind either the work of Franz Fanon's scathing critique of colonialism, The Wretched of the Earth, or Guillaume Pantocorvo's 1966 film, The Battle of Algiers, which depicted the tremendous cost of this war. So these works are what planted an early interest in seed in going deeper into this issue. My project originated with three main questions. First, how did the Algerian nationalists manage to oust the French when the French military defeated the Algerians on the battlefield? Second, what strategies did the nationalists devise outside of conventional warfare tactics to garner local and international support for their cause? And third, why did the Algerian struggle resonate with so many individuals, leaders, and organizations throughout the world? And what I found in my research is that the Algerian nationalists devised this creative strategy centered around the universal principles of healthcare, humanitarianism, and human rights that operated at the local and international levels and thereby circumventing the traditional roots of winning a war. Algerian nationalists, many of whom were part of the leading nationalist group, the National Liberation Front, or the FLN, used the provision of medicine and health care to win over the Algerian people by showing them that they could, quote, care for the welfare of their populations better than could an alien colonial government. In what was otherwise an extremely violent and brutal war, the FLN members used medicine to gain the people's trust and claim moral and social authority over their welfare. They did this by constructing a vibrant health services division 
that could rival that of the French state and convince locals that not only could they, but that they were ready effective immediately to assume responsibility for the people's care. The Health Services Division was a key component of the FLN strategy to establish and project state power in Algeria to Algerians. A small but influential number of Algerian medical personnel were critical linchpins between disseminating the nationalist message to the Algerian people and providing practical and in some cases life-saving treatment to everyday men and women who were caught in the crosshairs of war. Their work for the Algerian Health Services Division sent a clear message to the people and the French administration that the nationalists were capable of building and running public welfare institutions. And as such, Algerian nationalists anticipated that when given the chance, the Algerian people would choose their social services over those offered by the colonial state. After developing these healthcare strategies at home, FLN leaders applied what they learned to the international arena. Starting in 1957, the nationalists concentrated on expanding their health care initiatives beyond Algeria and sought international aid and support through a refined humanitarian message. The Algerian Red Crescent was the primary vehicle for disseminating this position and for soliciting financial aid abroad. And its leadership appropriated the universal language of humanitarianism and rights to substantiate their claims for sovereignty. Nationalists built upon alliances in the global south and viewed the internationalization of medical aid outside of Algeria as a critical tactic in gaining additional support. Moreover, they lobbied the Red Cross and the United Nations and deployed concepts of self-determination to help further validate their claims for sovereignty. The FLN's international humanitarian efforts represent another dimension of the Algerian state in waiting. They refined the nationalist message for external audiences and presented an alternative version to the world to that of the French government's portrayal of Algerian quote unquote terrorists. Similar to the nationalist domestic health care campaigns, the FLN Algerian Red Crescent campaigns showed that they were conversant with the language about human rights and humanitarianism and that they were ready to abide by them and put them into practice, and therefore that they were ready to govern Algeria. The nationalist efforts evoked the actions of a state before it was officially recognized as such, and they paid particular attention to establishing internal and external sovereign recognition of their right to rule Algeria, both of which are critical components of sovereignty. In the end, the nationalists won the war by successfully using these notions of welfare and rights to their advantage. So while some scholars dispute the idea that the third world played an important role in the evolution of human rights history, the Algerian case shows us otherwise. They exposed the hypocrisy of selectively applying universal discourse and provided a blueprint for claim making non-state actors could emulate. Consequently, anti-colonial leaders throughout Africa and the Third World saw Algeria as a model for success in developing platforms for claiming sovereignty. So analyzing the war in this matter, I argue, provides a different interpretation of the conflict because it focuses almost exclusively on what I call the social dimensions of war rather than on military or political histories or episodes of extreme violence. This is not to say that those didn't occur or that they were not important. They certainly were. Instead, my study starts to shift the focus away from these more tread topics of decolonization and proposes a way to place the colonizer and the colonized on more equal footing. Doing so allows us to better understand Algerian agency and ingenuity. This approach then offers new directions for studying nationalist movements and concepts of sovereignty that would be widely applicable to scholars of the global south. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to focus on the Algerian Health Services Division and the Algerian Red Crescent um, in more depth. But before I do that, I just wanted to take a brief moment to give an overview of Algerian history to situate us um, for the, the conflict. So the French began colonizing Algeria in 1830, as Bashar mentioned, nearly 50 years before the scramble for Africa, when most European countries acquired their African territories. 
France legally incorporated Algeria in, as part of France, and Algerians were not automatically granted citizenship. Despite numerous calls for reform in the first half of the 20th century, French colonial administrators did not implement meaningful reforms until after World War II. They were, the colonial administration was also frequently caught in the crosshairs between Algerian demands and settler demands, and they became increasingly um, more influential over the colonial period. So when the FLN initiated the war in 1954, the stakes could not have been higher. France had suffered humiliating defeats in World War II, and Algeria was considered the crown jewel of the French Empire. They were not going to let go of Algeria without a fight. Um, but despite this sort of imbalance of power, the Algerians did manage to circumvent their military might. And one of the primary ways that they did this was through their medicine and healthcare initiatives. There's some dispute among historians and participants about the precise origins of the health services division in Algeria and the extent to which it was operational. However, it's clear that they were not the only ones thinking about medical initiatives. In fact, the French had developed a very um, smart way of trying to integrate themselves with the Algerian population in the early period of the war. They developed a program called the Special Administrative Sections, and a large part of that was medical care. And they would send teams of doctors and nurses throughout Al the Algerian countryside, as you can see here, administering vaccines, teaching hygiene classes, treating children, and they published these images in pamphlets or in newspapers or in military medical journals so that people in France could actually see that there was more than this violent conflict that was taking place, that the French were trying to invest in the Algerian people. But mind you, this program started in 1955. Um, here's another image where they tried to explain that when they went to villages, the Algerian people would surround them in crowds, that their families would show up and be so grateful that the French had come and was paying them attention and giving them some, some medical, medical treatment. Um, the FLN tried to respond in kind by developing very similar kinds of programs. But in the first two years, they were really unable to get their initiatives off the ground. And a lot of Algerian nationalists, whether it be in their memoirs or I conducted some interviews with former medical personnel, they explain the tremendous difficulty of acquiring medical supplies. So Commandant Siazdin, he, I interviewed him in Algiers and he's written several memoirs in which he was detailing the hardship of trying to just sort of survive those first few years of the war between 1954 and 1956 and that the kinds of supplies they had were really improvisational. So they would fill syringes with water and honey to try to s preserve medication. They would mix eggs or milk to provide a cast or they would use branches or pieces of wood that they could find sort of around. But they didn't have a vast set of really reputable medical supplies. This was going to change in 1956. Um, there were two main events that really helped to sort of shift the dynamic in terms of how the medical um, infrastructure or the medical initiatives on the Algerian side was able to take off. The first of which was in May of 1956. There was a student strike where the Algerian Student Union called on all students, regardless of where they were in their training, to abandon their classrooms and to come and join the FLN effort. So if they were a first year student, if they were a second year student, a third year student, it didn't matter. Anyone who could contribute to the nationalist cause was tapped to try to help really support and move the nationalist initiative forward. And students really took this to heart. So there are several Algerian doctors who were both in Algeria and in France who said, we felt responsible 
to, to reply to this call and whatever knowledge we have, whatever supplies, whatever, whatever skills we can contribute, we want to do this. And there are education statistics that really actually show the difference between enrollments in 1956 versus 1957 had a direct impact. That the, the numbers dropped, the enrollment numbers dropped, which indicates or suggests that there was some, some response um, to this call. Um, there were also Algerian women, although in far fewer numbers, who responded to this call, who would bring their nursing services or any kind of skills that they could offer, whether it was clandestinely, because they may not have been in a, a, a training program, or if it was just sort of operating um, by making clothes or treating people in their living rooms or basements. But that was certainly another aspect of the student call that both women and men responded to. The second event um, was the SUMOM conference. And this was in August of 1956. And part of this, the impetus behind this conference, was this Congress, was to try to settle some internal political scores um, and also to figure out the ways in which the FLN could sort of push through the initial difficulties in the first two years of the war. They discussed ceasefire um, conditions. They discussed a whole plethora of items for what would happen in the event that they could get to the end of the war, the place of women, the place of Jews, the place of the internal and external delegations. Um, and one of the things that they really came away with was trying to figure out how to better organize the Algerian territory. Um, and they did this by dividing the country into six provinces that they hoped would then facilitate better communication and better circulation um, of troops and supplies. So after 1956, or after the August 1956 Sumam Congress, this was one of the innovations that helped to kickstart the health services initiatives um, because everything was supposed to operate at the provincial level. So there were instructions, FLN instructions, for the ways in which medical personnel were supposed to fill out detailed reports about who they were seeing, what they were treating them for, what the illnesses were, what medications did they give, did they come back, and this is a very um, interesting and idealized version of how this information was being recorded in 1956, 1957, because the likelihood that they would have been able to really create that paper trail, which I was not able to locate um, in the mm -hmm. Algerian archives, I did, and or the French archives, there were some sort of scattered reports here and there, but it wasn't as though there was just files of these copious reports, but in theory, this is how the medical services division was supposed to operate. And just like the French, who were very concerned with the images of taking care of the population, the Algerians were doing exactly the same thing. So they would take pictures of their doctors and of their nurses and medical personnel with the Algerian people saying, look, they are so excited that we are here treating them. They know that we haven't forgotten them. They know that we're pushing for, the, for their national liberation. They know that we're here to really think about their futures. We're investing in them just as much as the colonial state. And if they were able to do this, then that meant that there was sort of like a competing dialogue on outside of the battlefield, that the Algerians in some cases now had a choice about who they would get their medical services from and who then might better take care of them in the future. So if they could fan out to as many areas as possible, they might have a chance of sort of currying that favor. Um, the medical services within Algeria again, was piecemeal, but the fact that they were trying to project this power was quite significant. One of the other strategies that they did was that they developed the Algerian Red Crescent, which is a national society and derivative of the International Committee for the Red Cross. And technically, the way that this is supposed to work is that each country is allowed one national society, one humanitarian organization. And the French Red Cross was already operational in Algeria. The Algerian national says, we don't care. 
doesn't matter. We're going to create our own national society because we think that this is going to be another vehicle that we can use to help propel our message and sort of recast ourselves as humanitarians. So they announced their formation in January of 1957. They started writing and contacting as many national societies as they could around the globe. So there were some really fascinating exchanges between Algerian Red Crescent representatives sending letters to Egypt or to London or to Norway saying, announcing themselves and encouraging people to donate and to try to rally behind their cause. And this was incredibly effective. They actually managed to bring in millions of dollars of donations. They also acquired things like milk, blankets, clothing for children, in addition to some basic medical supplies. So this was a way in which for them to, again, directly counter the French portrayal of Algerians as being extremely violent, extremely brutal, not worthy of their sovereignty. But this was, again, shifting the battlefield to a completely different arena where the French could not exactly maintain or control this message. So imagine if you were in London and you get a letter saying, we are in dire need and you are a humanitarian organization, sort of your obligation is to respond in kind. The Algerians also went to Geneva and managed to successfully procure meetings with high up officials within the International Committee for the Red Cross. And, e and this again was putting the international organizations in a very precarious position because their mandate is to help those in need or to relieve suffering. But this was not an officially recognized organization. But they can't turn them away necessarily. So the Algerians were sort of strategically deploying all of these other sort of off-field strategies to acquire and claim legitimacy it, by saying we have had a meeting at the International Red Cross or we have received donations from around the world. That implies that people are supporting their cause in general. Um, they did a couple of other things that were fairly creative where they started staging prisoner releases in conjunction or in cooperation with the International Committee for the Red Cross. So these did not happen in Algeria, but they coordinated with the Algerian Liberation um, Army, and they, uh, they managed to get them to agree to release small numbers of prisoners beginning in 1958. And the Algerian Red Crescent would publicize these events to the highest degree. So this is a, an image from a prisoner release ceremony in Morocco that took place in December of 1958. And they tried to take as many photographs. In some cases, there were um, groups filming the events. They might have been working in conjunction with the Moroccan Red Crescent, excuse me, the Moroccan Red Crescent, or if they had several in Tunisia. But this was another way of sort of promoting their message of saying, even if the French are not going to abide by the Geneva Conventions, even if we haven't signed them yet, we're telling you and proclaiming to the world that we are adhering to humane practices, that we are going above and beyond what the French are willing to do. And therefore, how can you deny us our sovereignty? We are, in fact, more civil in our behavior than the French. Um, a third area that they were extremely creative in is capitalizing on the issue of refugees. So there was a refugee crisis throughout the course of the war, and refugees started spilling over into Morocco and Tunisia in the tens of thousands. And the Algerian Red Crescent decided that they would take up this issue not only as a matter of course because it sort of pulled at the heartstrings, but they thought that it would be a way of, again, acquiring more aid. They thought that people would really respond to the fact that children were living in deplorable conditions, families had been separated, they're traveling large distances um, to try and just really survive. So they started producing pamphlets in Arabic, English, French, to try to, again, export this message that the Algerians are not only suffering, but we are the true people who care for our people. You can't, we can't stand by and let this devastation take place, that we are going to try to remedy it, and you can help us in this partnership. Um, so these are some of the ways in which 
the project tries to really reinterpret the way in which the war was fought and the way in which we think about warfare. Um, and this was really only possible because of the ways in which lots of international doctrines and sort of the, the post-World War II moment encouraged a sort of shift in how claims could be made. If you have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, if you have concepts of self-determination, if you have renovated ideas about health and welfare that are supposedly universal, that means anyone who can sort of understand them, articulate them, and deploy them is an equal player in that game. It's not just the Western powers who are able to better articulate or maintain some control over these concepts. So the landscape looks very different after 1945, and the Algerians really manage to seize, seize on this, and they try to really renovate and reinterpret the way in which they can communicate with their own people and outside without having some internal recognition and, most importantly, external recognition it would have been very unlikely that the Algerians could have successfully made this case because the war could have sort of been over in a flash if we're just thinking about the actual military battlefield. There's not really much to talk about there. And so therefore, it means scholars have to sort of probe more deeply and say, well, what else was at play here? What else could have been going on that, ex that animated the Algerian nationalists, that made the Algerian people want to rally behind them, and that made the larger international sphere sort of come to their aid. So if previous studies have focused on the violence and the politics, what I'm arguing is that a healthcare approach and a welfare approach and looking at humanitarianism and human rights really offers us new directions for studying decolonization in general, but also specifically the Algerian War. Thank you. or liberal or radical French settlers or Algerians educated abroad play in all this? What role did liberal French... Well, people who were, people who were sort of betwixt and between the two worlds. I mean, I imagine there, there was a lot more medical expertise, or maybe this is wrong, uh, there was a medical expertise deficit between the French settlers and the, and the natives. Yeah. There's a, there's a huge deficit, I mean, in terms of the kinds of pathways for formal education or skilled training, it was extremely limited. And so there is actually a small group of, say, um, French Algerians who were interested in providing medical care. Um, so I interviewed a couple of those doctors, and they were saying that they were kind of caught between the colonial mission, but also feeling an allegiance to Algeria. And there, again, weren't a large number of those people, but they helped at least inform the ways in which you can think about these gray spaces within colonialism. There were also some French doctors and nurses who came from France who were also willing to provide their services. Um, Moroccans, Tunisians, Egyptians, Cubans. I mean, there were actually, there's, there's a fairly developed international response to trying to help flesh out these health services. Yugoslavia, I mean, there's a, in Eastern Europe, there was a fair amount of people also who contributed to this. So part of the strategy that the Algerians are devising is in these polarities, so the, the local and the international, but it's also to try to build alliances and to get people on board with their message. That is an excellent question, and that is the, the topic of my current project um, because basically I can't fully answer that question yet and I was very intrigued to see what happens next sort of like did the Algerian state 
deliver after 1962? Were they able to make good on a lot of these promises? I mean, part of what they were so, what they did so well is projecting their power and projecting what they wanted to do and the and image that they wanted the world to see. But from the initial research that I've sifted through, they were not able to deliver on, on the scale that they were promising. Um, and that there were some ser fairly severe disjunctures between what they said they could do and what they were then able to do. And some of that is structural. And to the last question, I mean, there are so few doctors, there's so few um, trained nurses, the, the medical infrastructure is in tatters after 1962. So to have to sort of rebuild that and start training an entirely new generation of medical personnel is going to take years, if not decades, and this is a slow process. So certainly in the 1960s and even in the 1970s, this does not happen. In fact, these uh, friends, they benefited from Algeria. Mm -hmm. Because there are at least, I don't know, in France, uh, there are at least 8,000 Algerian doctors working in France. Now. France. To the military hospital in Boulevard de Port Royal, mm -hmm. which is one of the best. <laughs> you have this, I mean, the promises are lost forever, I think, because, I mean, we are more than half a century after the independence, and uh, the hospitals are in a dire, I mean, situation. In Even though, as you know, Algeria is a very rich country. Mm -hmm. You name it. But I have a question for you. You started by saying that uh, well, there's this battle between the Algerians and the French about. Uh, at some point, I, I quote, you said, uh, care. The French wanted to show that they cared for the welfare of their people. The so my question is that the status of, I mean, obviously, it, didn't, uh, it wasn't that way. At during the colonization. It's at a very specific moment that during the war that France initiated this uh, health program. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I mean, the Algerians were not their people, French people. They were citizens of France. They have never been citizens. They were subjects, sorry. Not citizens. France. So the question is that, I mean, was it their people? The what French. is the status of the Algerian indigenous people for the French at that time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, th um, I think I meant to say, or I, I thought I had said, that the Algerians were trying to care for their people, but that the French had developed these initiatives to essentially assert more control over the Algerians or to disincentivize them from joining the FLN. So it was certainly a power play, but I don't think and I didn't mean to imply that the French then perceived the Algerians to be part of them. It was much more of a utilitarian function to say, well, we don't want them joining the ranks of the FLN. We don't want them harboring the, the rebels. We don't want them sort of actively resisting us. So therefore, we're going to develop all of these social services that had been absent, completely absent, as you're, as you're pointing out, during much of the colonial period. So perhaps one could argue that if some of these had been in place much earlier in the colonial period, there wouldn't have been this significant chasm between the needs and what was actually available. Perfect segue to my question because I wanted to ask to what extent is this kind of a, a strange case or in terms of um, decolonization, the extent to which medicine was used, or, or was this like part of how decolonization happened elsewhere? Um, because I know that, you know, like afterwards, then is the lesson that one has to be stricter in who to provide medical education for among the natives and mm -hmm. to be like more, um, you know, put more obstructions in place so that they don't join the decolonization? Is that is that one of the things that happens? 
more of a question. Well, I don't know if this is so unique in the sense that other other places undergoing the process of decolonization were not trying to also actively treat people within their communities, but I think it's something that we see where there is active warfare and conflict. So if there's a political or peaceful transition of power, as in the case of many countries in, in West Africa or even Morocco and Tunisia, where you're not involved in like an eight-year all-out battle, then I think the stakes and the process looks very different in terms of how you're communicating and conveying your nationalist message that you don't actually have to develop as many of these kinds of programs because the, the length of warfare is shorter and the stakes are lower. But I do think that the kinds of techniques that they're developing are relevant for projecting or thinking about sort of projecting a nationalist message. So you could do that through healthcare, and I think that that is widely applicable to many countries undergoing decolonization because people are grappling with these questions of the transition. Whether or not you're fighting or not, you still have the post-colonial moment and what's going to happen. So for example, in the De De Democratic Republic of Congo, there were n no universities that trained Congolese until basically four years before decolonization. So there were, and in 1960, there were zero Congolese doctors. So that is a major kind of open-ended question for what happens after decolonization. And I think that in many cases, other countries, you would find that the locals were interested in pursuing higher education or in becoming lawyers, doctors, dentists, pharmacists, but there just weren't many opportunities. So to see the ways in which the Algerians were doing it might have been sort of informative or inspirational, saying that this is a way to connect with the people after decolonization. Thank you, Jenna, for listening to you talk. I was thinking how scary it is, actually, how much we forget about this dimension of war. And of course, how, of the health dimension of war when wars and violence are, you know, when they're happening in front of us. Of course, I thought of Syria and the White Helmets. <clears throat> I guess my question <clears throat> is about um, the kind of services that were being offered. I mean, if you could just elaborate on it a bit more. I'm sure it's in your book. Um, but just, of course, I was thinking about the psychological sort of dimension of it, psychological healing, post-traumatic stress disorder, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if any of this was tackled by uh, the medical teams um, that you researched, and, and, and what are we talking about exactly? Vaccines, or are we talking about, you know, what kind of services? Yeah, we're talking really basic services. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about really well-developed psychological or services that are able, at least during the war. We're talking about vaccines. We're talking about bandages. We're talking about nutrition. Mm -hmm. We're talking about um, clothing to make sure people are not freezing to death and that they have some way to kind of survive the, the night or the, the, the weeks. We're talking about some stitching um, of wounds, but it's really, really basic in terms of what they are able to really provide. But what they're doing is, is transforming those basic services into a much larger register and a much, much larger message for what's to come next. So if we can do this in the midst of battle, imagine what we're going to do once yeah. we yeah. are sovereign and people recognize us and we can run our own institutions and we can have, we're formally recognized, we have diplomatic relations, we can set up exchange programs with nurses abroad, but it's, it's taking like the little seed that they have and amplifying it mm. to a much bigger register. Um, but I acknowledge that it's certainly basic, and that was sort of why I also wanted to highlight what happened between 1954 and 1956, just to sort of provide that baseline of how minimal, they, what limited resources they did have, and then therefore in 1956, 1957, when they start building, they're only building at you know a really small level, but they become very proficient in how to publicize their activities. I'm wondering if you would like to say a few words about 
the implications of your research on critical studies of humanitarianism that have mushroomed in the last 15 years, mostly with a focus on Europe and why international organizations and international human rights uh, developed uh, in Europe and then supposedly spread to the world. What, you, what you're saying is that there is a, a decolonization process perspective that also shaped the human rights um, uh, edifice. Yeah. Uh, and specifically, I'm interested in the relationship between these medical corps and the actual Algerian Army of Liberation. What was the relationship between the military and the doctors? Mm -hmm. uh, I ask because that's uh, one of the major themes in critical studies of human humanitarianism, <clears throat> and also because we are witnessing right now uh, Mosul, uh, expecting maybe up to 750,000 refugees just in the next few weeks. Uh, starting And UNHCR and the American-led sort of military onslaught on, on Mosul uh, have been cooperating very closely over the past year trying to figure out how to mesh military tactics with humanitarian relief. So I'm um, just wondering, what did that look like, if, if it, at all, during that period? OK, so I'll take, thanks for both of those. Um, the implications, I think, of this work for current humanitarianism studies or even human rights studies is such that I'm trying to insert decolonization back into the narrative. So there tends to be a big jump between sort of the emergence in 1940s of all of these kinds of new terminologies, languages, and doctrines, and then all of, then we get to 19, the 1970s, and that's really another plum moment of humanitarianism and human rights. But somehow, decolonization gets lost because perhaps the nationalist actors were not using them in the same ways that then Western actors were either originally using them in the 1940s or in the 1970s. So there's this sort of unclear understanding about the ways in which the doctrines could be used or the language could be used. And it had sort of, it's a, it's a difficult process to trace because they're not actually allowed in the UN, for example, if you're not officially recognized, how can you make your case in an international organization? But finding the circuitous ways in which they then lobby allies who then can go to the UN on their behalf, or then can go to the Red Cross and say, we are humane actors. But so there's a, there's a transition process, is what I'm arguing in, in the decolonization period, that enables us to better understand the wide range of how humanitarianism and human rights can be can be used and can then enable these nationalist actors a little bit more agency. They are at the forefront of this process. They're the ones sort of wheeling and dealing and trying to make sense of it. This is now an opportunity where they have a seat at the table, sort of an unofficial seat at the table, because they can think about and talk about and, and act out these humanitarian sort of practices. And I think that the ways in which non-state actors are operating in this period is very similar to the ways in which non-state actors now are operating in times of humanitarian crises, where they're trying to use either social media or some kind of way in which to disseminate their message. They're targeting international humanitarian groups. They're trying to get people to care more or think about their particular crisis. And that's sort of all they have at their disposal. And this is, again, sort of a similar scrappy tactic that the Algerians were using in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, to your question about the relationship between the FLN and the Algerian Red Crescent, it's, they, they are operating next to one another, but they are not immediately coordinating um, throughout the conflict. So certainly the FLN and the, Al the Liberation Army are out in the battlefield or they're out on the diplomatic battlefield and the Algerian Red Crescent is trying to operate outside of Algeria. They're also doing a fair amount of work in Tunis and Morocco, in Geneva, and the communication becomes difficult when you have so many different um, locations of where the Algerian nationalists are operating, but they do try 
to send messages, they do try to coordinate some of their efforts, but it's sort of a loose affiliation, if you will. Uh, hi, um, I'd like to congratulate you, first of all, for bringing up this subject. Uh, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's a subject uh, for us as Algerians um, that has never been brought up to light, and good job. Thank you so much for bringing it up. Uh, my question is, um, after 1962, uh, maybe in your research, were you able to find out why were, was Algeria abandoned by the U.S. after 1962? Uh, remembering Algeria growing up there, we had a wave of doctors and medical staff coming from Russia, China, Eastern Bloc, European, nobody from the U.S. I think the last time, or the first time, uh, the Algerian medical team was in Algeria was in 1982 during the earthquake of Al Snam, which was a, a big damage. Uh, that was the only time that uh, U.S. medical staff were on soil in, in North Africa and Algeria. We were able to find out why there was this abscess, even though the GFK administration in 1962 and before that, we remember fervently that uh, 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 GFK was fighting with De Gaulle in Paris mm -hmm. about Algeria's independence. Uh, Khrushchev was doing his best try to gain that, that, that ground, but uh, why, why did uh, the U.S. did not uh, I'm, I'm going to have to look so into that. Yeah, thank you for your question. I'm going to have to look into that because I don't have an answer right now because I'm not sure. I haven't finished the next project and I capped it at 1962, but because of questions like yours that I got over the years, I thought, well, I really need to, to pursue the, the part two of this. Um, and also to better understand why certain international alliances continued or emerged or were ruptured um, after 1962. I mean, certainly the Cold War landscape is heavily influential in that conversation, um, but I can't at this time answer about the U.S. I think it's contingent, at least in my case, and probably for many cases, and certainly the Palestinian case, on international recognition. I mean, this is part of what the Algerians, I think, figured out very early on, is that they can project their sovereignty through care and through institutions as remedial as they were, but without having outside assistance, without having outside recognition, without having outside donations, without having outside political um, alliances that enabled them to f further spread their message, I think that they would have short-circuited or that they would have sort of come to a dead end. So when you're raising the Palestinian case and how robust the current operations are without having as many international sort of external recognize uh, people, uh, external people who are recognizing, supporting, sending, I think that, again, you come up against a dead end because the sovereignty question revolves around internal and external recognition. I have a question going back to, I think, your second slide about 
Fanon. I mean, you've been talking about the institutional implications, um, both before and after, of performing statehood before it has even been granted de facto or otherwise. Um, but what about this argument about the necessity of healing the psychological wounds of colonialism that, of course, Fanon is centrally concerned with? Um, and of course, he examines that in light of violent struggle as well. But I wonder if there are implications for this kind of state building work in terms of precisely that problematic he's interested in, and if there's a way to trace that historically, archivally, uh, among the people who are participating in these efforts. So to try to better understand the, the aftermath, the psychological aftermath, and what would go on. So if you, are you suggesting that by merely looking at an institutional structure that you're missing a whole part of the healthcare or sort of mental health division? I wonder what you think about <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> My guess is I know what you think. Um, <laughs> I think that that's a fair. I think that that's a fair point. That this is sort of going back to Hanan's question about how do you start healing the, the psychological wounds of warfare. So even if you don't have, if you're not missing a limb or you haven't lost a family member, what does it mean to have been displaced? Was it? What does it mean to have sort of survived violent a attacks on your village? What does it mean to have had children? starved throughout the course of the war. I mean, there are some serious psychological implications that I do agree are very prevalent. The mental health sector of post-colonial Algeria is not very well developed, um, and I don't think that this becomes a priority necessarily for the expansion of healthcare services, certainly not in the immediate aftermath. Um, what is interesting, and I think what takes place in many post sort of nationalist moments is that you have the glorification of the war, which I actually think sort of serves to undermine mental health, because if you're talking about the glorious victories that were performed or that you survived or that you did during the war, it's hard then to create a space in which to say, I'm suffering, I have PTSD, I have nightmares, I can't sleep, I can't eat, I feel agitated, I'm crying all the time. It doesn't necessarily align with that really glorious narrative. Um, and that may be one disjuncture in trying to think about the, the underdevelopment <laughs> of mental health in Algeria. Just to add to that, I think um, another way of looking at that is that perhaps coping strategies for psycho psychosocial injury were not necessarily medicalized in this context. Mm -hmm. and, that they, and that's why you don't see them in the medical setting. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you.